Hami teko epi. Anke il botaine e makia pia. Wana da koda makoche bede ota utume de taha woa dake makoche kiende da koda ta makoche. Ka tiwa he mitawa kia tungashidang waye kia makoche kiende ich upi ka da kuku ota ga mazaska ich upi da koda oyate ta etaha ga na koda oyate taha ich upi cha he on wana da kori api kia ospemich ichie ka wa shicho oyate yutoke cha pi wa cha mi ka ya pi chi hatawani ka makoche kende da koro yate kikchu pikte wachi wana na ya hobi cha pidama ya yape hello everyone i'm anka el bataine speaking to you from the city of minneapolis on dakota homelands these Dakota homelands, which we know as Minnesota, were taken from the Dakota people. My ancestors participated in the taking of the land, the resources and money from the Dakota and Nakota peoples. And so now I work to learn the language to strengthen the language and to change uh, Minnesota so that it is returned to the Dakota people. Thank you for listening. I'm introducing myself in this way because one of my current areas of reflection and work is under the umbrella of decolonization decolonizing how I understand my own self, my own identity in relation to the land where I live and its history and decolonizing the way in which I allow myself to be held accountable and to enter into relationship with the people who have been harmed uh, by the genocidal agenda of the United States government and the white settlers who came to settle this land, uh, among whom are my ancestors and from which I have benefited indirectly. So thank you for listening. This is a video about my explorations of the question, which is about decolonizing education there's many areas in education which we have had significant discussions about decolonizing and there are publications about it. But I feel there are other corners which have yet to have had much light shed upon them, at least in an explicit way or in a way where we're using that decolonizing vocabulary. Often they're being worked on by people who might not be framing it in such a way, but indeed, they are working on decolonizing. And so the question for me is, what all is there to decolonize in education? What all are we talking about when we're talking about decolonizing education? And what I wanted to do was create an inventory of all the topics, areas, things that we might consider decolonizing. Um, because I think it helps to zoom out very far and take a bird's eye view of what all is defined by culture when we are in a learning environment and whose culture is defining it. Of course, we know that schools and universities, not only in the United States, and Canada, North America, not only in Western Europe, but in fact, thanks to colonialism around the world, uh, 
we know that these institutions are heavily, heavily influenced or completely defined by white Christian middle-class culture. And there may be some differences across that with regard to the European country of origin, but they are very small. In general, we can we can easily generalize about a European uh, culture with regard to the way in which it defines education. And so when we're rethinking education, I, I want to urge us to really rethink every element of education down to the nuts and bolts that hold it together, down to the most basic ingredients. And so this is a challenge to myself to try to list all of the areas into which I would like to shine a light and I'm creating this video to invite you into conversation with me, to share resources that you know about each of these different topics, to question, challenge, add topics that um, you see which you, which you question or that you don't see on this current uh, list or mind map that I'm about to show you. And also um, to hear what happens when your wheels start turning about these topics. So I'm going to display a mind map that I have been developing. And I want to say that this is not something that has been very long in progress. It's, it's really quite a new project. And it's a project that is um, meant to be extremely iterative. It's just meant to be a jumping off point. Uh, this is in no way meant to be exhaustive. And it's also not something I plan to do in isolation. Uh, I would not be able to decolonize anything in isolation as I am a product myself of colonial uh, culture and society. Um, but this is just uh, a way of organizing thoughts that helps me think of new ideas and think more deeply about my ideas. And I hope that you will join me in exploring this um, if it has the same effect for you. So the central question here is what can we decolonize in education? And so this is sort of a list and the list is sort of arranged spatially, although these are not meant to be firm categories or associations. And in fact, rearranging the associations is often quite fruitful in terms of um, making new connections and inspiring new ideas. So there's absolutely nothing against uh, moving these around or re organizing them, the organization is not meant to be definitive or even very formal. Um, but there's sort of conceptual uh, alignment and, um, and it covers some different areas. Aside from that, I've, I've put these images um, on, uh, on the poles uh, labeled evidence and values, which is to say that I think that we structure each of these dots, each of these topics, around these two things to varying degrees in some balance with each other, either around what we value and what our culture is, what we think is important, or around evidence that we've learned. And those two influence each other, but there are essentially two ways of approaching things. So to say that everything must be evidence-based contains in and of itself uh, a very strong ep epistemological bias that is very culturally embedded. But certainly evidence-based changes are relevant for everyone and could be considered by any cultural uh, group or in any cultural pro project because a lot of times when we talk about values or we talk about cultures, we think about them as frozen in time. Often when we're talking about decolonizing, there's a tendency to think that everything is about returning to what was before colonization. The problem with, oh, with that being, of course, that it, it can't be done. <laughs> and also that it doesn't account for uh, both the way in which the people themselves have been changed and altered by colonization such that elements of their previous cultural norms may no longer fit them. But also it discounts any positives that we might want to incorporate. Um, and while of course, colonization has been incredibly almost unfathomably destructive. Um, there have of course been some, some elements of progress and innovation uh, 
along the way that we may choose to keep uh, depending on our values. So we're balancing evidence-based practice and values in some relationship to each other, but every person and group will be deciding the balance between them um, for themselves. And of course, I've uh, given a special color to the idea of challenging, decolonizing the ultimate goals of education, because I think that in a way, this is logically the first step that we rethink why we are even educating and then everything flows from there. Um, but a lot of times we're not able to think really clearly about such a huge question. And so if we're not, we can start with any, we can really start anywhere and work in any direction across, across these ideas. And we may start to develop a vision for what we think the ultimate goals are as we ask ourselves questions about each of these topics. I'm going to start with what I think is the most obvious and familiar to folks and then move around. So one thing that we can decolonize, of course, is the structure of curriculum. And this has been attempted um, or rethinking the structure of the curriculum has been attempted by uh, projects such as Montessori, Waldorf, uh, democratic schooling, there's lots of different takes uh, on this. And of course, indigenous people have engaged in restructuring this to varying degrees all over the world, uh, sometimes quite extremely and sometimes quite uh, superficially. But it's clear to everyone that this is on the table to be reconsidered, examined, challenged, and potentially decolonized. Theory is another one that has been explicitly discussed and explicitly challenged um, through in a lot of literature. So it's a place we think about decolonizing. Um, grading. So how we grade students um, in, a, in other countries, they refer to this as marking or noting the students, uh, how we evaluate them, how we assign uh, merit or value to their performance. Um, is of course something that many people are uncomfortable with and they may not think about it as a colonial project, but they certainly have thought of lots of different ways that we could approach that. And of course, many people have proposed throwing it out entirely. It's clearly an area of contention and it's clearly an area that deserves deep rethinking. Even if we decide ultimately to continue it very similarly to how we're doing, it deserves a comparison to our values and the evidence that has been gathered ab about it. How we divide up the subjects has also been something that's gotten a little bit of discussion, meaning where do we draw the line between uh, math and science? Where do we draw the line between science and history? And why are we, why are we drawing these lines? Why, why are we deciding that there's language arts and then there's history and they're different? Um, what's the benefit of that? And, and does it reflect uh, what we really believe? It does it really reflect our values? Um, is something that's had a little bit of discussion, but certainly could use deeper analysis. Research methodology is something uh, in recent years that's gotten a lot of discussion about decolonizing research methodology and removing the harmful norms uh, in research. Probably the most talked about of all is learning materials. People, when they, a lot of times when they talk about decolonial pedagogy, they talk about changing up the novels that we read, changing the types of textbooks that we use or not using textbooks, uh, changing up uh, the kinds of uh, materials that we require students to spend time on. So for example, including more videos or including social media or including authentic materials such as actual news articles. Um, this is something where uh, almost every practitioner is actively reconsidering what the learning materials should be. To consider that through a decolonial or culturally specific lens, of course, uh, means uh, joining that question with other questions like what is the structure of the curriculum and what subject is this about, since the learning materials follow from those decisions. Another area is uh, I've written games, so we might think about physical education. 
but we might also just think about games that are played in the classrooms um, and the way in which really the co competition really uh, is introduced and education is often gamified and what values uh, we are embedding when we do that, what uh, ultimate goals are we expressing for education when we do that, often that is going to be deeply culturally embedded and perhaps objectionable uh, from another culture's point of view. Just as many people have questioned giving, giving a certain grade or mark to a, to a student, and just as many people have questioned what is considered to be science and what is considered to be math, et cetera, many, many people have questioned how we decide that students should move on and when we decide and, and whether that it should be done uniformly in a group or each individual should move on like mastery-based education or whether um, the, the moving on should be a result of time or a result of age or a result of mastery or a result of exposure or a result of interest. Uh, there's a lot of thinking about this, even if it's not labeled as decolonial thinking. Um, to reconsider how students move grade levels, how they move from class to class, how they move from unit to unit, uh, and what when we decide, how do we decide when it's time to present something new or when it's time to stop teaching about a topic. Um, these are things that, that folks are, are playing around with, but we, we often don't talk about explicitly as something that we could potentially uh, think about decolonizing. Um, there are, of course, wonderful material uh, for specific subjects, decolonizing science, decolonizing math, decolonizing history. And we will try to make a, a, an inventory of those uh, on the shared document that I'm going to post in the, in the links. Um, I invite you to contribute the resources that you can think of and also to find resources there uh, that make it pertain to specific subjects. And they may do any of these um, other types of work that we describe here. They may question any of these other norms within education from a decolonial lens or otherwise. Um, and they may be good jumping off points for us, even if they don't pertain to our specific lesson plans that we're about to teach. Another area that has had some thought and discussion is around language and around the norms of relating to one another within the spaces. There has, of course, been a lot of discussion about cost. Should education be free? We, we're several centuries into that discussion. Um, but when we think about access, we often don't think about language, and it's very important. It's not only about access, but it's also about value, prestige, and uh, priorities that we assign. So often the language, uh, the language of instruction, which language we will deliver the information in um, is, is not critically examined, uh, partly because uh, there's a, a, either an accurate or inaccurate belief that teachers have a very limited uh, repertoire of language. In fact, even monolingual teachers have a broad repertoire of language that they can potentially use. So there has been some thinking about how language differs from cultural group to cultural group and how language with, used within the classroom could be altered to be more empowering or to create better relationships. But it's also just important to think about the language of instruction period as a barrier to entry and as a way of reflecting a set of values. Um, and of course, there are so many immersion schools that have been founded uh, for specifically for that reason to offer a different language of instruction based on a different set of values and sometimes based on evidence. So language is worth questioning, uh, even in a monolingual setting. And there's some great writing out there, which we'll share, as well as it's worth considering in a multilingual setting, what message is being sent and what values are being expressed by language within education. And of course, uh, that's the literal meaning of language. We can also think about language as containing the concept of terminology and the concept of 
uh, idioms that we might use and we think about the power of those in creating a more or less empowering environment. And so of course that is something that many people are working on as well. When we think about uh, things like guest speakers, these are choices that we make that reflect our, our values or perhaps evidence that we have found about what will be effective or what is important. And so when we think about in our schooling experience, who has been invited as a guest speaker, we're able to pick apart quite a lot of the values that were being expressed through those choices. And so it's worthwhile to sit and think about guest speakers as a phenomenon in education and uh, what is the ultimate goal of guest speakers and how is that being expressed through them? Um, how are they aligned to the ultimate goal of bringing them on board? Clothing and presentability uh, might seem obscure, but in fact, we don't often question that. And, and, and where, it, where it comes up is on dress code violations or when teachers may wear the traditional clothing of their people and be told that they don't look professional. Or um, there may be a controversy about uh, the class connotations of clothing that is worn within schools and, and whether um, wearing clothing associated with a lower class status perpetuates that class status and whether that can be reversed by wearing clothing that's associated with a higher class status, et cetera. This is something that, that people are engaged in even though they may not think about it as a possible area for decolonizing. But of course we can think about cl clothing as extremely embedded within culture. And then we can think about the norms of what we consider to be presentable or professional or appropriate for school. Um, as deeply cultural and something that we may decide to shift in order to make a decolonial or post-colonial education environment more welcoming to the people it aims to serve. This is a very concrete one, talk time. It means literally the number of minutes and number of seconds for which the teacher is talking versus the students. And uh, we all know that we're very prone to talking when in fact the students have sort of tuned out and we actually need to be more concise or give more space and more silence. So that part is being talked about, but also who talks and who talks when and what are we allowed to talk about and to what extent, if, if something happens, something traumatic happens on my way to school or if my grandma died yesterday, to what extent is talk time turned over to me to do what I want with or to what extent is it controlled and the content is monitored uh, by the teacher and, and what does that reflect about the aims that we have? Demands on attention is the idea that uh, we have cultural beliefs about what considers what is considered to be paying attention and whose attention span is the correct one. There are a lot of judgments about uh, particularly shorter attention spans and whether they indicate laziness or whether they indicate a lack of self-discipline or a moral failing of some kind and what implications they have for the future of the child. This is a very hotly debated topic but it's almost never discussed from the idea of a colonized idea of, of what we should be paying attention to, or to be more concrete about it, uh, a capitalist view of what we should be paying attention to, where we should be budgeting and allotting our attention um, is something that capitalism cares a lot about. And so it's worth rethinking what is the kind of attention that is valued by our culture and then by the evidence that we have seen in terms of what people are experiencing and what they might want to experience, how they might get there. Uh, there's a lot to explore within demands on attention and a lot to reconsider based on the cultural framework that we want to use. Decolonial pedagogy is not in and of itself a cultural framework. It's the idea of challenging the cultural framework that exists within the colonial, Euro-colonial school system and bringing 
one's own or one's local cultures to bear in as far reaching a way as possible. This might not seem obvious to people, but once talked about, usually people can really find this in their own experience. That, that space, how space is allocated within rooms or even virtual rooms, um, who gets it to take space, what space is dedicated to, these are all deep reflections of our values and something which we could consider decolonizing. One very simple concrete example is that a lot of Indigenous people will uh, intentionally set up a room to work in a circular way as opposed to in a rectangular way where the lines are straight because the circle engenders a lot of the values of the culture and produces the kind of interactions that they wish to see, that they value culturally. And that is of course very uncomfortable for people with opposite values. So those are, are things that can be rethought, especially when one has control over the program or the school. Um, as well as the body's experience of being in the space. So when we say the body's experience, I'm referring to light. Uh, is there natural light? Is it fluorescent light? What kind of choices about light am I, am I being given? How am I being exposed to it? And is that healthy for me and for my students or whoever we may be? And, and right up there with it is food. Same questions for food but also important to consider the movement toward native foods and the restoration of indigenous food systems, the building of alternative food systems so that they can be informed by indigenous food knowledge as well as available to those who are not given access in the, in the capitalist system. So there's a way to rethink about the food that gets eaten at lunchtime or that enters into the classroom and think about how it is it is colonial or has been colonized and then work through creating similar food that doesn't have those problematic elements or that reaches a different focus. Along with how our bodies are experiencing the space, we can talk about the times of day that we're expected to be in the classroom and we can critically rethink whether those really make sense for us based on evidence and based on our values as well as the seasons. We have very few industries that run on a really seasonal schedule as much as academia does. And there's a lot of assumptions about our lifestyles and our values that go into giving us a calendar with as much seasonality as it usually has. So these are all related to body autonomy. Seating, of course, is something Many people have tried to change up already because they have been feeling it themselves or noticing that after a short uh, experience in a classroom, uh, the body becomes sore and doesn't like some of the choices that have been made because they're maybe cute or they maybe match. They're not actually very ergonomic. And so thinking about that for the individual as well as for the culture, what does seating do for the cultural interactions that we have. Um, this is a pretty rich area that some people have explored. A lot of people have explored experientially, but it's worth um, considering how to write about considering space and seating when working with uh, decolonial educational content. Of course, all of this also is tied in with what types of buildings we decide to build and how we decide to use them. And that is, again, an area that has been explored largely on the construction side and on the home building side, but is worth exploring um, within our current classrooms as to whether there is anything that about the building that could be changed to profoundly influence their experience or anything about their experience that has really been augmented by their experience of the school building or any other building. Of course, nowadays, security is a big conversation at school. And of course, that is laden with many cultural assumptions. 
So there is a potential for rethinking and reimagining what safety at school looks like, particularly given the lack of effectiveness we've seen uh, of law enforcement in uh, eliminating social problems and making everyone feel safe in an equitable manner, we see that that isn't the case. And so security of school is really ripe to be reconsidered. What is the goal of it? How is it implemented? How are we using that topic to do better than the cities and states around us, which is what we would hope we would be doing. Finally, I think some of the deepest questions that we can ask are over in this area here. So the very idea of who educates whom and starting when and how, what qualifies one to be a teacher, what qualifies one to be a student, um, when, when does one transition from one to the other or transition back. The divisions here have a lot to do with hierarchy and a lot of what colonialism has left us with are um, very culturally inscribed hierarchies that very often do not match with colonized cultures and also uh, are often very destructive to them by virtue of the existence of the hierarchy. So it's not to say that colonized cultures or usually non-hierarchical, but it's to say that the particular hierarchies and role assignments that are imagined in the colonial model um, are by definition deeply, deeply cultural. And we can reconsider them in light of different values. And we can also reconsider them even within the colonial European middle-class values uh, with regards to evidence. Uh, there's really a lot of room to think deeply about those um, and ask ourselves, uh, how do they relate to our ultimate goals? What is our ultimate goal with the entire enterprise of, of education? And what does that mean for who is a teacher and who is a student and what the, their roles are? Within that, what teachers are expected to do, this is something we see discussed within the context of the labor movement, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has really brought this to the fore, uh, where we really think about what, what is teacher labor and what are teacher responsibilities. And we see that there are even pretty drastic differences between, for example, US white middle class culture uh, expectations on that and legal expectations on that that there's quite a lot of mismatch there. And so there's really a lot of room to reconsider what we think an educator's job is, uh, which ties into who the educator is versus who they educate, which ties back to what are we even trying to accomplish with education. Who they educate also has to do with family engagement. This is kind of a buzzword uh, in a lot of US schools at least uh, and there's a lot of thinking about power dynamics, particularly racial dynamics within family engagement, but it really ties back into who is engaged in education, what their roles are and why we are doing education. Um, so there might be even deeper elements to reconsider in terms of family engagement when we are speaking about children, but it's also worth venturing so far as to think about family engagement. When we think about adult learners, there's, there's a lot of room to really reconsider some of the assumptions that are baked into our current system. And those reconsiderations would have major implications. With that, we can think about who is grouped with whom. And I worded this very openly because I think there's many ways to interpret groupings of people. Uh, of course, we've had a lot of legal discussions uh, about grouping students, for example, as special education or as English language learners or as gifted. Um, but we can also think about grouping such as grouping children by their age. Um, we've talked to some extent in the culture about grouping children by perceived ability or perceived interest, but we often haven't really looked at the cultural underpinnings of those. There's some evidence about some of those approaches leading us to believe that some of them are problematic, but most of the examination hasn't been very deep 
we can carry that forward into thinking about teachers. How are teachers grouped and students grouped, teachers grouped apart from students? How are teachers subgrouped? Uh, who are grouped as administrators? Who are grouped as parents? Um, how are parents subgrouped? How are administrators subgrouped? Um, there's really a lot to explore there in terms of how we relate to the community and what elements of the community are preserved within the educational enterprise or institution and which are repressed or reorganized by that institution. Classroom management and discipline, um, I've listed them separately because it, one important aspect of that line of thinking is that they are distinct things. Many times people are using the words classroom management. What they really mean is discipline. Discipline meaning how we create compliance and what we do when we don't get compliance. Classroom management really intended to also refer to things like routines, norms, expectations, what is rewarded, what is considered appropriate at different times, how things are organized, literally where things are put within the classroom, who can go get them, who can touch them, who can distribute them, um, where people are sitting for what activity or standing for what activity, um, the, the, the routines, the way that we sort of train uh, ourselves as well as uh, children or uh, adult learners to behave in order to make the classroom a routinized, calm, controlled place. So we can think about those as values. We could reconsider them as well as everything that flows forth from them. Discipline being then what comes in uh, when those routines or the, that control and compliance isn't immediately grasped by all of the participants. We've talked about redefining what teachers are potentially responsible for, who a teacher potentially is, and then um, of course what they are learned, how they are qualified, which is tied in with what we have said about what, what falls in within the teacher sphere and then is tied in with crisis management. So we've uh, talked up here about relationship to the community. So we could think about an example like are there nurses from the community who are in the schools? So um, if you go back a few decades, that was a norm. Generally that has been defunded um, in the US, but it's an interesting way of thinking about community to classroom connections and how we deal with crises. So crises are sometimes related to discipline. So we've had um, really horrible examples like the story in Florida where police came to a school and handcuffed and arrested a six-year-old for having what the teacher considered to be a tantrum in the classroom, not complying to the norms of the classroom. So law enforcement was used, adult uh, lethal force uh, potentially uh, was deployed to manage what was considered to be a crisis. But we've also had counter examples where a social worker or a nurse engages with a family to look at much deeper solutions or look at systemic issues that may be affecting them, such as hunger, homelessness, uh, health, chronic health problems, um, a death in the family, these kinds of things. So the crises are always a really great way for us to watch a system break down and really see what it's made of, really see how it truly functions when we watch it uh, misfunction. So crises uh, also tie in, of course, with things like security of the school, uh, how we deal with traumatic events that happen within the school or lack of safety within the school, such as um, gun violence. Um, so this is really an area where we can think about what values have been baked in and what evidence has been used uh, to lead to the kind of crisis management that we're currently doing and what all would be needed upstream if we were to change that and offer a different kind of crisis management um, for and, and what kind of crises we even have and how often they even occur. As I said earlier, all of these link back to what we decide our ultimate goals are and those are very much embedded in our values. And to some extent we might inform them with evidence or particularly our lived experience of what education systems have brought us before 
we certainly have international testing outcomes, we have political trends, social trends in society to show us what our current models of education are getting us. And that might help feed back into a discussion of what we would like to change and what we would like to set as our ultimate goals, which reciprocally informs each and every one of these topics. So you'll see that you have a link to a document that you can edit. I'm very hoping that everyone will want to thought partner on this or contribute their thoughts or at least leave a comment. Very much interested in different ways that other people might see this. So I'll be sharing a document where you can place links that you have to really great resources for decolonizing anything within education or education itself uh, so that we can start to build a, a, a nice um, accessible library of those. I'll also share a template to this mind map that you can edit and make your own. You can rearrange, you can reword, you can translate to another language. Um, all of this is shared under a share alike attribution Creative Commons license, which means that you can't monetize anything uh, out of this, but you can create something and then share that and ask others to share as long as you always give attribution. And so we wanna bring as many people into this conversation as possible. And so you can make this graphic your own, you can edit the document and you can also leave comments to spark thoughts or share where your thinking is at or any amazing examples that you have seen of attempts to rethink, redesign, reimagine any of these elements of education. So thank you everyone for your involvement, past and future in this discussion. Thank you for your attention. And I look forward to engaging with you and co-thinking with you going forward.